Yes, um, so much of what you said, Grace, really resonates, uh, not just for Uganda, but, but globally. Um, I'd just like to touch on a few points. Um, PLAN, as some of you may know, um, is really a child's rights um, organisation. Um, but we do have um, a very big focus on girls and on adolescent girls. And occasionally we have difficult conversations about this. People even who say you are being discriminatory against boys. You may be surprised, but that, that does come up. And what we say is, no, actually, we are all about empowerment of some of the poorest people in the world. But the facts are, and if you look at almost any of the facts, are that girls are still hugely disadvantaged, discriminated against whichever way you wish to look at it. Um, and therefore, we've set up programs, and we have a big global program called Because I Am a Girl. And because I'm a girl, was set up um, after a few years ago, one of my colleagues uh, was in Nepal and was going to visit some schools on an education mission and saw oh, lots of children working in the fields on what was a school day. And when she got to the school and she said, you know, what are those children doing um, working? Why are they not in school? The teacher looked quite surprised and said, oh, well, it's because they're the girls. Mm -hmm. As if the, it's a rather strange question, he obviously thought. <laughs> and so she came back just filled with sort of rage and, and sadness, actually. And we started Because I Am a Girl. Now, one of the reasons that we concentrate also on adolescent girls isn't because we believe that there is some additional special discrimination that kicks in at adolescence. It is because at adolescence, um, a lot of the discrimination and inequalities um, that females um, endure uh, crystallizes. It's because adolescence is a particularly dangerous time for girls. It is often at that time that they get removed from school in order to marry or have children. It is the time when far too many of them have babies when they are still children themselves. And as you may well know, um, the single biggest cause of death for girls globally is pregnancy and childbirth. This is extraordinary. If that was the case for any other sort of population, there would be an uh, uproar. But the biggest single cause of death is pregnancy and childbirth mm -hmm. for teenage girls. Terrible. Um, so, but I'd also like to come back to Grace's point. I mean, there has been good progress, and the MDGs, I think, have proven themselves, however much we may criticise uh, mm. inaction, mm. um, and MGD2 on education has been mm. really a success. It has been a rallying cry, <coughs> and it has been a good mechanism to enable us to put pressure on governments and on donors. Mm. And the, the evidence of how you can create success in, say, primary mm. enrolment is great, less great for secondary, yeah. and less great certainly for completion. Mm. And so at PLAN, we, uh, along with many other people, we really are pushing for nine years of quality education for girls um, and to get serious about education so that the education has an impact. Mm. Because as Grace said, um, we really must stop looking at sort of projects, uh, sort of project attitude where you do one little thing and you mm -hmm. work with schools and forget completely that the education didn't mean anything. It didn't have an impact on this young woman because... The purpose of the education is that so that the young woman can move and transition into adulthood with opportunities that can be fulfilled. And what we see instead is that adolescence for girls being a time of opportunities shutting down. And you get this very strong feeling when you talk to young women all over the world that if you talk to them when they're five or six, some of them still have great dreams. Yeah. And you talk to young five-year-old girls and they'll talk, tell you they want to be a a lawyer or a doctor or, a, or an air hostess, one who said to me last week. Um, but you talk to them at 14 <coughs> and there's a much more subdued mm. sort of, they may say, realism. And that is um, very sad. Um, one of the things that um, I think we've also found um, in the development field is that there has been something of a move from a rights-based approach to a sort of economic, um, value-driven approach. What I think the World Bank sometimes calls smart development. 
Now, you, I'm sure you're all aware of this. There was a, mm -hmm. a move some time ago, and people said, look, how do we get change? How do we change these mm -hmm. social norms, these sticky social norms? And one you know, bright idea was that we impress upon people the value of women, the fact that if you educate a woman, she will bring more assets to the household, that if you prevent and put off, postpone um, childbirth, um, and space children, that the woman's value will be greater. She will educate her children. They will uh, have more value. In fact, people have even put a, a figure um, on the sort of GDP uh, of countries um, that preventing childhood marriage will, will increase um, the, the country's wealth. And that's, that's fine as a persuasive argument, but I do think that we need to be careful of this, um, this notion that you educate a woman or you prevent childhood marriage because it will increase wealth. Um, I think it's an argument that actually diminishes us all. I think an over-reliance on um, putting you know, the dollars uh, as an, uh, an argument for stopping childhood marriage is, is, uh, yeah, is, is diminishing. Um, I think that whilst we do want education programs and we do want financial <coughs> empowerment programs for girls and, and young women. Um, I think that the bigger issue, the much bigger issue is how we really understand how we can transform gender relations. Now that's a huge thing to talk about but it really is essentially it's the underpinning of all of these issues. It's the underpinning of um, female fetuses being aborted, the underpinning of female girls being abandoned, the underpinning of childhood marriage, pregnancy, dropping out of school, and so on and so on. All of this, you know, there is a common theme hanging underneath all of these factors, uh, which is the need to transform and bring equality into gender relations. <laughs> and that is why, um, you know, we do need to push for, we need to, to fight for, um, in the post-2015 environment, mm -hmm. standalone aims and goals on gender equality. It really does matter. It's why we need to remind people that the NDGs have had an impact. They have worked, you know, in some areas very successfully and others less so. But it is why we still need to have faith, if you like, in policy, in legislation. Mm -hmm. Um, in order to insist that gender transformation is a really clear and loud part of our post-2015 development world. Thank you so much, Tanya. Thank you. Yeah.